Hello everyone, my name is Heather and this is a little bit of a different video. In this video, I'm actually following up on a short that I made recently that got a really great response, okay? I'm gonna link the short up here. Now, this particular short was actually cut down, it was a clip that I cut down and um, edited from a longer video. The, the longer video was all about packing and um, traveling with luggage. And I will link the full video right here if you wanna go back and watch that. Now, on that short, I did link the full video. So hopefully at least some of the people who watched that short, I realize that's two completely different audiences on YouTube and elsewhere. The people who watch YouTube shorts tend to be kind of the same people that watch reels on Instagram and TikTok. So it's a completely different audience than the people who would watch a long form video like this. But hopefully some of those people who saw that short will have subscribed or watched me regularly and will also see this video. I wanted to respond to that video because it got such a huge response. Okay, what do I mean by a huge response? I always get a little excited when my shorts do well because they bring in a lot of new viewers that hopefully will continue to follow my channel. That's not always the case, but it's something we hope for because it gives us a lot of views very fast. But I'll show you two things. This is what the normal trajectory of a short is like. Almost every short you see out there, this is what they look like. We get a huge burst of initial views and then it just stops. <laughs> it just flattens out. And that's how most of them will look. But this short that I'm responding to in this video did not look like that. It just kept getting more and more views and that was really kind of interesting to me. The one other thing I want to tell you about shorts, which many of you probably don't know, is shorts make us no money. <laughs> you have to be exceptionally successful, probably at just shorts and getting way more views than I do on your shorts for it to be worth trying to earn a decent living off of. We earn literally pennies on shorts, so it's not very much money at all. Just something that you thought you might be interested to know. The other interesting thing about the response to that video was it got more comments than I would normally get on a short. Usually when people are going through shorts, they're, they're just scrolling through one after the other. It's very unusual for people to stop and actually comment. Now I did get some quite mean comments, some of which I had to delete. So if there's name calling or people saying, you know, anything mean about my kids or really horrible language or something or they're threatening me or something, those comments are always going to get deleted off of any video I make. But I also had a couple of comments that brought up some really interesting points that I wanted to discuss. And then the other thing that I noticed was I got a lot of likes on this short, more than usual, but I got even more dislikes and that's really weird the only other time i've gotten this much hate if you will off of a video was a video i made back during the like early part of the pandemic when we went to wisconsin dells and we went around to the different water park resorts and made videos about how each of them were doing with you know safety during the pandemic to just kind of give people a comparison like we felt great wolf lodge was doing a really good job we did not think Kalahari Resort was doing a very good job. And oh my gosh, did I get hate on that video. I got so many views on that video, but I got so much anger and rage from people. Obviously people who didn't care about um, safety during the pandemic and who were really loyal to Kalahari apparently. But I ended up having to take that video down because it got so bad. So that's the only other time I've seen such a negative response, I guess, if you will. Views and bringing eyes to my channel is always a good thing, but having a lot of hate directed at you can be difficult for us as creators sometimes. So it wasn't anything necessary that I felt like I needed to take this short down, but I wanted to address some things that people brought up or I guess a couple points that people made that I really felt were, were very good points but also how many dislikes I got on that short indicates to me that those people who were disliking that short were probably doing it because they're in the carry on only camp. They didn't like what I had to say, even though it's true. <laughs> okay, so first of all, I wanna cover the two points that people brought up that I thought were really good points. 
I mean, please go watch the short if you haven't seen it already. But if you if you haven't seen it or or watch that entire video, because there's definitely more context if you watch the entire video. It was about packing and bringing luggage with you when you travel and all sorts of things related to that and tips. And in that particular short, which I pulled obviously for dramatic effect, I focused on the fact that flight attendants and um, flight crew do not like when people are insistent on bringing their suitcases, really. It's small suitcases, but still suitcases, onto the plane instead of checking it. Obviously, there's some people who feel very strongly that they're only going to do that. And my point was, because I've had employees of airlines tell me this, they really don't like it because it, it slows down the boarding process. Okay, so that's what the short was about. And I'm going to come back to why I think that made people angry. But let me first cover these two points that people made that I thought were really good points. One person said that they were very unhappy because they've had a lot of issues with their luggage getting damaged by the baggage handlers. First of all, that is a concern. However, I can't say that I have ever actually had any, I've never had anything damaged. And I mean, I probably travel a lot more than most people. I mean, there's definitely people who travel a lot more than me, but I definitely travel a lot more than most of the people in the United States. I totally understand that person's frustration. It's obviously very upsetting if your baggage gets damaged. We've all seen, even if you're sitting on the airplane looking out the window, sometimes they're maybe not as careful as they should be. But actually, I don't think that what's happening there is probably necessarily the baggage handlers, the people. I think it's more likely that it's the baggage handling equipment. So that's an issue of, you know, the actual infrastructure inside the airport that you don't see, you know, passengers never see. That stuff can be kind of rough on some, on some suitcases sometimes. So, and you also have to remember again that they're trying to move a lot of baggage in a very quick amount of time. So you need to give them a little bit of grace on that, but I totally understand that it's upsetting if your suitcase gets damaged. That's why it's really important to take a picture of your suitcase before you check it because then if it is damaged, you will have proof or evidence that you can show the airline that they did damage your bag. They are legally required to reimburse you for damage. There's another YouTube creator who makes shorts about this. She's a lawyer. You can find her. I'll link her up here, but I can't think of what her name is. She talks about this stuff all the time. You do have recourse with the airline if your baggage is damaged during handling. The person specifically said, well, they should pay for my luggage. They will pay for your luggage. So um, if you haven't taken advantage of that, then that's on you because they, they are legally required to pay for your damaged bag. The other things that I thought of when I saw that comment, one was, I hate to say it, but you probably need to invest in some better luggage. If you're having repeated instances of your luggage being damaged, that shouldn't be happening. And so something's not up to snuff with your bags. I've never had a suitcase damaged ever. You're going too cheap on your luggage. You've got to invest in some more durable, higher quality luggage, I would really suggest. That might solve your problem right there. Then the other thing I would suggest for anyone, anytime, is get travel insurance. Because travel insurance will cover stuff like that too. But you need to get like a comprehensive travel insurance policy. Don't just get the little coverage that they try to sell you at the end when you buy a plane ticket. InsureMyTrip.com is the site I always recommend to people. I actually now, because of how much we travel, I buy an annual travel insurance policy that covers everything, cruises, COVID, all of it. If you take three or more trips a year, that's when I would suggest considering an annual travel insurance policy. But if you're just traveling every once in a while, just insure that trip and include the value of your suitcase and the value of the contents of your suitcase in your estimate of the total amount that the trip is worth when they ask you for that. That was a very good point that they brought up, but those are some things I would suggest to um, kind of alleviate that issue. Okay, the second thing that somebody brought up in a comment was really a good point, which was they need to stop incentivizing people carrying on. And that was a really good point. They have now made it so you pretty much always have to pay to check a bag. 
Now, I talked in the full length video about how there are several ways that you can fly with free checked bags. I, I mentioned that one of them was having status with the airline, which we have. One of them was having one of the airline's credit cards, which my oldest son Andrew has. One of them was flying on certain kinds of flights, like an international flight or like on Southwest. And one of them was flying in a better seat that includes a free checked bag. So like business class or first class. Now, I realize that all of those things I just said cost you money in some way. And I totally sympathize with everyone who feels like the airlines are incentivizing you to carry on because they kind of are, except all the discount airlines. The discount airlines are not doing that, as I talked about in the full video. They always charge you to carry on a bag. So that argument will not work on discount airlines. I do remember when all checked bags were free. And it was very unusual. You know, back in the 80s, 90s, it was very unusual for anyone to not check their bag. Everybody always checked their bag. That was just standard. You always checked your suitcase. The fact that people bring so many small suitcases onto the plane now is different. That's new and different. And part of the reason they're doing that is because they don't want to pay to check a bag. So that's on the airlines, yes. But the other reason people are doing that is because they're nervous about their stuff getting damaged or lost, which I totally understand. But hopefully, if you watch that full video, you'll see that your concern about your suitcases getting damaged or lost is probably unfounded. I mean, in most cases, your stuff is fine. I think people worry about that more than they need to. If it's costing you money to have to check your bag, yeah, you're going to want to take it on with you because it doesn't cost you money to do that. But that does not change the fact that everybody bringing their suitcases on board and trying to fit them all in the overhead bins slows down the boarding process and causes other problems. Here's some things about that that I don't think most people who fly realize. Number one, your seat that you paid for, your ticket, does not entitle you to any overhead bin space. There is not a little section of the overhead bins that's reserved just for you or for, for your seat. You're not entitled to the space directly above your seat. You're not entitled to any bin space at all. They don't have to put those bins up there. And back, like when I said, when everybody used to check a bag, it was very unusual for people to put stuff up there. So that's one thing. You're not entitled to space that is not included in your ticket. And you're definitely not entitled to certain space. You know, no, 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 this is for me. I'm in this seat and I get this. And you'll see passengers arguing over that. Secondly, the overhead bins are only meant for things that will not fit under the seat in front of you. If you have a purse, if you have a backpack, if you have a jacket, if you have some little small thing that will fit under the seat in front of you or that you can hold, you are not supposed to be putting that in the overhead bins. And so many people do that, that that takes up all the space that is supposed to be taken up by suitcases. Another thing people don't realize, and I talk about this in the full video, flight attendants are not supposed to help you put your bags up there. They could get injured just like you can, which is one of the reasons I avoid it. I already have enough problems with my back. You shouldn't be carrying on expecting that the flight attendant is going to put your suitcase in the overhead bin for you because that's not their job. That is not their job. That's your responsibility as a passenger. If you want something up there, then you have to be able to put it up there and you have to be able to get it back down. I mean, once in a while, they might do it just to be helpful and nice because they're in a good mood or whatever. But that brings me to my next point that people don't realize. Flight attendants are paid hourly. And they are not paid until the door is closed. A lot of people don't know this. I just learned this recently. Flight attendants are not paid for their work until the door of the aircraft is closed. And the flight is, you know, technically started. So all that time you guys spend boarding and getting those suitcases up there and wanting them to help you and asking them questions and all of that stuff, they're not getting paid for any of that time. So that might make you have a different perspective of it right there. If you realize that 
oh, wow, all this time I'm sitting here chit-chatting with them and trying to get them to help me find a place for my bag and switch my seat and all that. They're not getting paid for any of that. Another thing about a flight crew that a lot of people don't realize, and I actually learned from reading a novel that I was actually talking about it with, um, with a flight attendant on a flight one time because I was reading it on the flight. Uh, the flight crews don't know each other most of the time. They do not work together all the time. There's thousands and thousands of flight attendants and they are assigned based on their individual schedules and where they live and all of this stuff. And like, you'll hear them say like this Minneapolis based crew or this Atlanta based crew. That means that most or all of the flight attendants that are on that particular flight are from that place, but they don't necessarily know each other and they may never have worked together before. If you watch their interactions with each other, it's kind of awkward for them because they've never met this person before. I mean, once in a while, they'll run into people they've worked with before, but every flight is a different combination of flight attendants that have ne may have never worked together before or ever met each other before. So that's a whole different dynamic, and that gave me a whole new perspective on what it's like to be a flight attendant because I didn't realize that. And like when you see them, if you're ever around long enough, for example, if you're waiting at the gate for your flight, all, everybody had to get off. And then the last people you'll see get off is the crew. And then the, that's when the cleaners are cleaning the plane for the next flight. Okay. You'll see those flight attendants come off and sometimes they come off in a group like together. And sometimes they come off in like a couple different groups or whatever. And they're pulling their bag. They're going to another flight. Okay. They work multiple flights in a day and they're not done yet. So your flight was not the only thing they do that day. In most cases, they're going to another, I mean, unless it's late at night and late in the day, they're not done. They have to go fly another or two more flights yet that day. So keep that in mind <laughs> when, you, when you're hassling the poor flight attendant. And again, they're going to be, with, they are probably going to be with a different group of people. Or, you know, maybe two of them may be together or something, but it, it's all mixed up all the time. And then I want to remind you too, this kind of goes back to the not wanting to pay. You can still check your bag. I said this in the full video and I love this. You can still check your bag for free at the gate. They'll take that bag happily from you and not have to worry about finding overhead bin space for it and not have to worry about, you know, getting it up and down from the overhead bin and all of that. The airlines will charge you if you kind of knowingly brought a bag that exceeds the size limits for carry-on luggage. So if you show up at the gate with a suitcase that's too big to fit in the overhead bin, they're going to make you check it and they're going to charge you. But if you bring a carry-on suitcase that does not exceed the measurements that's allowed for the overhead bin, they will happily take that bag for you and check it for you for free. We've done this a lot, and I've shown it in videos. Watch any of my travel day videos. You'll see us do this. So we might have two suitcases because it's a longer trip or whatever. We often have this happen when we go on a cruise because we need a little suitcase to get off the ship on the last day, or sometimes we're staying in a city after. Like every cruise we took in 2023 was like this, where we needed another little suitcase because we were going to have a separate set of days spent in the embarkation port city either before or after the cruise. And also because <laughs> you don't want to be getting off the cruise ship on the last day with no clothes. <laughs> okay. So you need something to put your stuff in. So because of that, we almost always have like at least one extra little suitcase when we fly, when we go on a cruise. And so we just plan for it. We're, we take it, we'll take it through security because we're only allowed with status or whatever, those things I talked about for getting a bag, check bag free, you're usually only allowed one free check bag. And then you'd have to pay for the second one if you had more. So we'll take the extra little suitcase through security, but then we'll check it at the gate and they check it for free. And the way that that works is they give you the sticker for it. They give you the checked bag sticker. You just go up to the, the gate agent and say, can I please check this bag? And they're like, sure. And then they give you the sticker for it. You know, they scan your ticket or whatever, your boarding pass. And then you go sit back down at the gate and you still have your little suitcase with you. And then you take it on the jetway, but you leave it at the end of the jetway before you get on the plane. And I've showed this in at least one video. So it's the same as what you would do with a stroller or a wheelchair. So if you are bringing 
a stroller for your child, I've done this too. You push your kid in the stroller right up to the door of the plane, but not into the plane. Same as a wheelchair. If, if the person is ambulatory enough that they can get to their seat okay, you push them in the wheelchair right up to the door of the plane, you know, then they get up and they get on the plane. Or you pick up your child out of the stroller and you put them on the plane. Or you leave that checked suitcase that you had at the gate right there at the end of the jetway where the door is. There's a door that goes outside with steps that go down to the tarmac. And then the door of the plane is right there. And you'll see people leaving stuff there. And that's why. Because that stuff is going to get manually loaded by the ground crew from that spot. They're going to carry it down those stairs and stick it in the belly of the plane right before you take off. It's like one of the last things they do before the plane pushes away from the gate. And so that stuff is the last stuff loaded. They, they literally, there's no way that's not going to get on there because they literally are physically taking it right from you practically and sticking it in the plane. And so the other nice thing is that stuff is also the first stuff off the plane. And one of the reasons they do that is so that the ground crew at the other end, wherever you fly to, can have those wheelchairs and strollers ready for the people that need them. So when I've had my babies or my toddlers with me on planes, I will push them right up to the door of the plane in their stroller. I take them out of their stroller. I leave the stroller there. It has a tag on it. You gotta get a tag for your stroller too, or your wheelchair. And then when we get off the plane, our stroller will be popped up and ready and sitting there waiting for us to put my kid back in. So it's really nice. So that's how that works if you've never had to do that before. The last thing I wanted to talk about was the same people that I think complain about or were upset that I pointed this out, that flight crews don't like everybody bringing on their luggage like that, is because because it takes up so much time and it slows down the boarding process. Here's some things you need to remember, because I think the same people that complain about the one thing are going to complain about the other thing and not think about how they're related. It, it does. I mean, I've heard so many gate agents say it. Folks, the thing that takes us the longest, it's the bags. The bags are slowing us down. Please check your bags. Come check them. They'll beg you. <laughs> the gate agents will. If you fly enough, you'll hear this. They'll say, the bags slow down boarding. We're, we're behind schedule. Come on, we got to get going. Check your bags. You don't need to put it in the overhead bin. You know, we'll, we'll check it for you for free. They'll, they'll actually say that. So you know it, they don't like it. And the flight attendants, because you now you know they're not getting paid for the time that you're getting on there and finding your seat and then trying to find someplace to stick your suitcase. And then the other thing I want to remind you that's very important and that probably would bother you if you realize you're contributing to it is flights are on a schedule and maintaining that schedule is extremely important for a couple reasons. One Air traffic control is extremely complex. If you look at FlightAware or any kind of flight tracking app at how many airplanes are in the sky at any given time, it's insane. Okay, there's so many planes that have to be routed and directed so they don't hit each other, either in the air or on the ground. And you don't want that to happen, so it's a safety issue. You've got to maintain that schedule. It's really, really important, not only for safety, but also because if one flight gets delayed, then it has a ripple effect, and it affects hundreds, if not thousands, of other flights. That's why it really messes everything up when there's bad weather and flights get canceled or delayed. It's such a mess. And if you think it's a headache for you as a passenger, just think about how difficult that is and how stressful it is for the people who have to fix it. And then the other aspect of this is from the passenger's perspective. Passengers don't like being delayed. They want their flight to leave on time. They want their flight to land on time. They want everything to go smoothly. They don't want their flight delayed and they don't want their flight canceled. Now, if that's important to you, if you want to make sure that you're getting where you want to go in the time that you're supposed to get there, don't contribute to the problem. And people don't want to accept that they might be part of the problem. People are taking too long to board because they're messing with the bags, 
which 99% of the time, that's the problem. They're contributing to flights being delayed, which affects that whole ripple effect, which affects other flights, being able to get where you need to go in a timely manner and all of that. And so if you're doing anything that's causing the flight to not leave when it should, then you really shouldn't be complaining when it doesn't get where it's supposed to go on time either. Kind of related to that, this is the last thing I'll say is, the flight crew and the cabin crew's primary concern is your safety. Anything that you're doing that distracts them from that task, try not to do that. They're also concerned with your comfort and that you're feeling all right and you know you have what you need and stuff like that, but their primary job is safety the safety of the aircraft and the safety of the people on the aircraft. And you've got to remember that. And any kind of problem you cause is not only delaying things, but it's also compromising safety. They can't show that safety video or give their safety demonstration, which you should be paying attention to. Check out this video. <laughs> okay, for a lot of reasons. Until the door is closed everybody's seated, everybody's buckled in, everything's put away. And sometimes by then the pilot is scrambling to get out of there because it took so long for everybody to board and stole their bags. So they need to have time for that because that's their primary concern is safety. I had so many thoughts after I saw the response to this short <laughs> that I felt like it was worthy of making an entire additional video about it. So I hope that you learned some things in this video because there's definitely stuff in here that I've learned only recently. And it's important things to know because it'll completely change your perspective about how things work when you fly and how you can contribute to things being safe and timely and comfortable for everyone. If you found it interesting or helpful at all, I would really appreciate it if you would give me a thumbs up down below. If you don't want to miss any of my upcoming travel content, make sure that you are subscribed to the channel and click on the notification bell so you get a notification each time I put up a new video. Thanks for watching everyone. Have a great day and safe travels.